Hey everyone, uh, welcome back. This is a wrap up lecture for week four of Econ 170 talking about monopolization and price discrimination. We started this conversation in class, we didn't quite wrap it up, and since we're gonna have a virtual lecture on Tuesday, I wanted to go ahead and give you all a chance to come and see what we're talking about. So, I'm gonna go through the slides, talk about it, draw a couple of graphs. Some of it should be a review, some of it's gonna be a wrap up of this chapter. This is chapter eight in the Viscusi textbook that we're using, and again, we're just gonna be talking about monopolization and price discrimination some case studies, some examples, um, and some of the history of it. So let's get started. All right, here we go. So, like I said, we're gonna talk a little bit about establishing monopolization claims, the development of antitrust case law, a little bit about predatory pricing, which we did talk about in class at length. We've talked about a lot of different types of predatory pricing and how we've identified it and the theories around it. So we'll slide through that and a couple of case studies that we haven't talked about yet. And then we'll talk about two final ideas, refusal to deal and price discrimination. So let's get into it. So first of all, the whole point is that monopolization is the act of monopolizing a market. Being a monopoly is not against the law. And so when we talk about monopolization, what we're talking about is violating Section 2 of the Sherman Act. And I did a cheesy thing where I read that Section 2 to you all, but basically it's a intentional act of violating um, and monopolizing a market. And so there's two parts to establishing guilt and monopolization cases. There's the effect, right, the monopolization, but there's also the intent, right? You have to mean to monopolize this, um, the market. We talked about the learner index being a measure of monopoly power. And remember, it's not, it's price and marginal cost, right? Um, but it's also the inverse of the elasticity. And that's because the more market power you have, the more ability you have as a firm to raise prices without seeing a reduction in quantity demanded. And that's a really cool measure of market power. And so think about when someone raises the price of a good. If you could buy something else, if there's a substitute, then they're not really monopolizing the market. Um, and this gets to something we talked about last time and we'll talk about in the future, uh, we'll talk about here, is this idea of how do we define the market? And so if there are substitutes, um, then we're not talking about a very narrow market. And we've got our little monopolist in equilibrium here. And so remember, monopolists see that demand curve, see that marginal revenue curve, produce at marginal cost equal to marginal revenue, and then charge prices based on demand. So when we see very, very large elasticities, a change in price having a big effect on quantity demanded, there's not going to be a lot of monopoly power. Um, and one of the cases in the book, and I put this in here because I think this is a useful way to think of it, uh, this idea of defining the market, is an old case from 1956. Uh, basically, the argument was that DuPont had a monopoly because they had 75% of the cellophane market. But they only had 18% of the broader market for flexible wrapping materials. So think about foil and other things. And so depending on how you determine the market, we can determine whether they're really monopolizing. And so on the one hand, they do dominate the cellophane market, but consumers have other options. And so we don't see it as necessarily um, real uh, monopolization. Um, but we can think of another way of looking at monopolization is looking at the distance from price to marginal cost. And this is one of the really complicated things about these cases is trying to figure out how do we measure monopolization. Uh, another cool example from a long time ago is a vertical integration example for the market uh, for aluminum. So Alcoa is an aluminum industry. They produced uh, aluminum final goods, fabricate final goods made out of aluminum. And what they did was they ended up vertically integrating to the point where they captured every stage of production from mining bauxite, which is an input into aluminum, and then extracting the alumina from the bauxite, and then producing the aluminum ingot from the alumina and then finally using the aluminum to fabricate the final processes. They, they had the entire market um, 
monopolized that they were able to drive costs down and absorb the market share. And so that's another example that we can think of, of a way to try to monopolize a market, or at least a way to be very good at um, controlling a market. Um, we talked about monopolization claims and um, monopoly power. We said that uh, Franklin Fisher, economist, said it's not just about market share, it's also about substitution, how easy it is for competitors to increase or decrease output using the facilities they already have, right? Therefore, how much market share can they, how much can they absorb in terms of the market share? Um, it's also about whether or not they can convert to different markets and whether or not new competitors can enter. It's really hard to argue a monopolization claim if there's really easy entry and exit in the market, right? Um, intent to monopolize is really hard to prove um, because superior efficiency or just getting lucky is not a violation of the Sher Sherman Act. You have to engage or intentionally force other companies out of the market. And so predatory pricing is one way to try and establish intent. But it can be really hard to differentiate between predatory pricing and vigorous competition, right? And so um, we talked briefly about um, IBM um, and their um, really aggressive pricing and how it was seen as there were some assumptions that it was predatory, but really it was just really competitive. We talked about three distinct eras in Section 2 interpretation from 1890 to 1940. Courts required evidence of abuse and intent. Um, there are cases like Standard Oil um, where we see firms lowering prices to try and force prey firms out of the market and then later raising their prices to recoup their losses. Um, we had 1945 to 1970 when the courts relaxed their um, their or changed their interpretation of intent and no longer required evidence of abusive acts to infer intent. But then since the 1970s, courts have been much more willing to let firms dominate markets without necessary, necessarily inferring intent to monopolize and just sort of allowing uh, them to just be competitive, superiorly competitive. Um, we talked a little bit about, actually we talked for a long time about Frontier Airlines and United Airlines as an example of predatory pricing. Um, and so with the Frontier Airlines example, um, we look at this idea of trying to force, of creating, first of all, defining markets, right? Is the market for all routes or is it just for this one route? And then looking at um, whether they were able to disrupt the other airlines um, control of that market, right? And it gets at these questions of um, whether or not we can, a firm can influence the other firm's entry or exit, and when is it optimal for a firm to use that predatory pricing. And then this idea that it really is a trade-off, right? That the firm has to give up current period profits in order to get um, those future profits associated with um, being a monopolist, monopolizing the market. And so we talked about this idea that there's a period of the demonstrative market where the firm doing predatory pricing has the low, low prices to try and force the other firm out, and then they can go up to these high predation mark, uh, prices where they're finally earning higher prices or, high, or charging higher prices and earning economic profits. And that's the recoupment market where they recoup uh, their losses. Uh, we talked about briefly the standard oil case being re-examined by economist John McGee in 1958. And he basically said that um, the fact that other firms could enter into the oil market at any time meant that Standard Oil would always be sort of having to engage in predatory pricing to keep other firms out. And so it wasn't rational to engage in predatory pricing. It was just vigorous price competition. Um, because of the ease of entry, um, it wouldn't have ever, they never really would have been able to guarantee earning their um, that extra profit back, making their money back, getting to that recoupment period. And so that's a different way of looking at the predatory pricing, especially the older cases. So then we talked about the three 
predatory pricing models that are more modern, the financial market predation, which is basically saying, hey, financial markets don't have perfect information. Banks and uh, people who loan capital to firms don't know how stable they are, how solid they are, how credit worthy they are. And so predatory pricing might make a good firm look bad and then that might make it worse for them. Not only now are they subject to this heavy price competition because of predatory pricing, but now they also look like a failing firm to the capital market and they might not be able to you know, sell stock or get loans or something like that. Signaling theory says that um, reputation and information can enhance the ability to deter entry or induce exit. So basically, um, predatory pricing, it's not just about having low prices and forcing them out because they can't cover costs. It's also about um, scaring firms away, right? Signaling that uh, this is a market that I'm going to... Um, I'm going to have a reputation for having low prices in and I'm going to make it hard for you to compete. And then the theory of test market predation, not that different, but the idea here is that it's basically lowballing the competition during market tests or market surveys, obfuscating or confusing what the market conditions actually are and basically preventing firm entry in that sense. So those are three other theories of predatory pricing. Um, we can also talk a, we talk a little bit about reputational theory of predation. Basically, the idea is that if you establish a theory or you establish a reputation of aggressive pricing as a signal, then you have then you can deter entry of new firms. Um, and so we can see that incumbent firms, especially if they have if they don't have very very low or very very high costs, if they sort of have uh, moderate costs, it might be more effective at preventing them. Low cost firms are willing to enter in and the aggressive pricing doesn't scare them away. High cost firms, where there's an expectation of a sort of capital component that might make it less terrifying, right? Might not make it as effective. Um, but basically, it's not that dissimilar. It's, it's this, it's not that dissimilar from the signaling theory, right? It's deterring people from entering the market. Um, there are, now we're getting into new stuff, Three rationales for why firms might have below marginal cost pricing in the short run. And so now we're saying, hey, maybe it's not predatory pricing. Maybe there's a really good reason. So there are three efficiency rationales for firms to have short run promotional pricing. Prices that might look like predatory pricing, but it's just for the short run and it's not actually predatory, it's for a rational reason that's not about monopolizing a market. And those three reasons are promotional pricing, learning by doing, and network externalities. Promotional pricing is pretty straightforward. It's the idea that, hey, uh, we can grow our market by having low prices now, and then in time we'll be able to raise our prices once consumers value our product and know that our product is good. And so we see this with, my favorite example is HelloFresh. How many people have seen an advertisement or gotten a coupon for like six free meals from HelloFresh? They feel like, hey, we will give it away because you're gonna like our stuff so much. Um, that you will continue to pay for it once we uh, have given it away for a while. Um, so we see promotional pricing a lot, right? It's not that they are engaging in predation, right? They're not being predatory. They just, it's their method of advertising. It's promotional. Uh, learning by doing says, okay, maybe firms become more efficient over time. And so their marginal costs might actually decline and so um, if there's a complex production process or something like that then we might see them price low below marginal cost with the expectation that marginal cost will go down and um, and make it up so like if I put my prices here even though my costs are above my prices the assumption is I'll get more efficient and my costs will go down so I want to keep my prices where they are um, and so that's the idea that, that it's not that the firm is being predatory, it's that they are at the high cost stage of production and they will get to a lower cost stage of production when they get more efficient from learning by doing. Hopefully that makes sense.
Number three, network externalities. Network externalities are present when the value of a good to a consumer depends on how many other consumers use it. What does that mean? This is a cool thing. We'll talk about this more when we talk about more modern antitrust stuff. But the big idea here is that um, there are goods for which the value is not just in my consumption of it, but also in other people's consumption of it. So whether or not you consume a Diet Coke does not alter my enjoyment of it. But if I download Venmo and no one else has it, it has no value to me. But each additional person that I know who downloads Venmo is now a person that I can trade money with easily. That's network externalities. It gets more valuable the more people use it. You can think about social media as a great example. I don't want to go on Instagram if there's nobody on it. But if I can see what Serena Williams is doing, then yeah, I would like to go there and see what is going on. I have some questions. Um, and so network externalities are a situation where as the quantity consumed goes up, the value of the good goes up. And so we might see pricing be low in the beginning as it gets started because the expectation is the value will go up and they can raise the prices once those network externalities take hold. Hopefully that makes sense. We'll talk more about network externalities. So if you're still soft on it, we'll get there. But a lot of modern stuff, um, a lot of tech is based on some kind of network externality. So think about ride sharing, dating apps, Uber Eats, anything like that, right? Uh, DoorDash. It has value when lots of people are using it. Um, and so that's the network externalities. If no one else is using it, it doesn't have much value. But the more people use it, the more efficiently it works, the more valuable it is. That's what network externality is. So as the quantity consumed goes up, the value goes up. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so this gets us to some interesting antitrust policies. Okay, so the Arata Turner rule um, says that basically it's a Philip Arata and Don Tur Donald Turner in 1975 basically raised the bar for proving a Section 2 violation. Uh, their article was published in the Harvard Law Review, and it basically said that any price that's below marginal cost is going to incur losses, um, but for quantities that are larger than the optimal quantity, we might see average cost be lower than marginal cost. See, I told you, this is where you really need to remember your cost curves, right? So basically, they said maybe we don't use marginal cost as the metric for whether or not we're seeing predatory pricing and monopolization. Maybe we use average cost too, and maybe it depends on the market. Um, and so because we could see prices be above average cost but below marginal cost, there might be some gray area. And so um, the case in Brown Williamson, the court argued that they would not basically Brown and Williamson was or Brooke versus Brown and Williamson was a tobacco case where um, Brooke was a generic tobacco company and then Brown and Williamson, um, responded to the Brook Group's generic tobacco by undercutting prices. Um, and the court argued that Brown and Williamson could not be expected to recoup their profits. And so it couldn't be predatory pricing because it would never be profitable. Um, what we've seen is that this decreased the um, incidence of predatory pricing uh, claims being effective. And so for a visual look, here we can see, so we can imagine a world where you want to remember, let me, let me draw this for you and then we'll talk about it. So remember that the marginal cost curve is going to cross the average cost curve and the average variable cost curve at their minimum. So we're talking about the costs associated with a firm producing a good. And just like you can see in this graph, um, let's try this. 
All right, now we got the stuff. We can have an average variable cost curve that looks something like this, right? And then a marginal cost curve that's coming up through it like this, through its mid median or through its through its low point. And that's going to be the optimal production level, right? That is the scale, right? That's that's where economies of scale are maximized and costs are minimized. That's where a firm would optimally like to produce. But we can imagine a place where a firm might be producing somewhere like over here below the optimal point. And so prices might be below average cost, but still be rational to be at marginal cost. And so maybe what we could do instead of comparing it to marginal cost is compare it to average variable cost. Um, and so maybe that's a better way. That's what the Areta Turner, Areta Turner rule says, is that predatory prices under average total cost, um, that maybe we could see predatory pricing be, or on unlawful pricing, be prices below average variable cost because marginal cost can be lower than average variable cost in some cases, especially if the firm is underproducing. And this gets to, interestingly, I mean, if you think about those arguments for why we might see low prices, if the firm is doing the learning by doing or the promotional pricing or the network externalities, it makes sense that they might be not at Q star yet and still starting out and growing their company. And so they would have lower prices. And so the array eternal law really changed the way that we looked at predatory pricing. Um, real quick, we'll burn through a couple of case studies. Um, we talked a little bit about the Brook Group versus Brown and Williamson tobacco case. That was the array eternal law back on the last page. Basically, um, it laid out, it was useful because it laid out a two-tier policy for judging predatory pricing. It said that it's going to have to be prices below an appropriate measure of cost, whether it's average variable cost or marginal cost. So that low pricing, that predatory pricing. But they said that there also has to be a reasonable possibility of subsequent recoupment of those lost profits. If you're not going to make your money back, then you're not predatory pricing. You're just being competitive because it's not rational to have prices be so low if you're not going to get profits later on. Um, we can also look at more recent cases. Uh, there was a 2001 case involving American Airlines and low-cost carriers looking specifically at the market coming out of Dallas-Fort Worth. And again, right here, we're defining the market not as all airlines, but specific markets. So airlines in Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, and basically what they saw was that there were... Um, American Airlines was entering previously abandoned routes with larger planes and lower prices. But the cost was about $41 million. And so um, what was found was that it was a recoupable cost and that it qualified as reputational predation, basically scaring those other low-cost carriers out of those markets. Um, the Northwest and Spirit um, Airlines case, uh, Northwest Airlines was the incumbent and Spirit entered the market. Before entry, Northwest Airlines would charge between $189 and $411. Um, and then um, Spirit enters, and all of a sudden, Northwest lowers prices to $69, increases the quantity of flights, increases the size of planes, and Spirit exits in months. Um, Northwest was able to recoup their lost price, their lost profits from those really low prices, right? They went from 189 to 411 to 69 dollars to force Spirit out of that route, um, and so it they were able to recoup because of barriers to entry. But they did actually end up in bankruptcy. So uh, maybe even though Spirit lost the case, they in appeals Northwest also kind of lost out too. So maybe don't go into airlines; it's very competitive. And then in 2007, Weyerhaeuser Company versus Ross Simmons Hardwood Lumber case. This is an interesting case because this is a case of predatory buying. Basically, um, Ross Simmons argued that uh, Weyerhaeuser, Weyerhaeuser was driving up prices of an essential input um, and basically using monopsony power. What they were doing was 
called in the textbook, they call it, or I don't know if they call it in the textbook, but I've seen it called predatory buying, which was basically they bought up tons of the input lumber, the raw materials at such high quantities that it increased, it shifted demand out, it raised the price and Ross Simmons could no longer compete or afford to buy the raw input, basically forced them out of competition, not by lowering the price of the output, but by buying so much input that the price was too high to buy. Uh, in 2007, uh, the re Supreme Court, this was art went all the way to the Supreme Court. They reversed the lower court decision. Uh, the test this court applied to predatory pricing claims that uh, uh, applies to predatory pricing bidding claims. And so it was found that even though, yeah, Weyerhaeuser did buy up tons of those raw materials, that's just competitive behavior, not monopolization. So I think that's an interesting case too. The last thing we want to talk about is refusal to deal and essential facilities doctrine. Refusal to deal is um, this idea that competition is vital for firms, but uh, firms with market power have a a duty, a duty to deal with the competition. And so there's a tension between this premise of competition and um, and sort of playing nice in the industry. And so the different types of refusal to deal that we can think of are um, two firms in the same market, um, and maybe they want to engage in a joint venture. The second firm, if the first firm refuses, the second firm can argue that's a refusal to deal. Um, we could think about exclusive dealing when a dominant firm um, might try to use contracts or something to refuse to deal with any other customers or firms from another competitor, um, or when a firm has a monopoly over an input and then competes in the final product. So if I have uh, control over all the diamond mines and then I refuse to sell diamonds to any other jewelry company and I also have a jewelry company, right? That'd be refusal to deal. And so um, it's, we can think about refusal to deal as basically being, it is a, considered a violation of Section 2 of the Sherman Act, and it's a situation where someone is behaving explicitly anti-competitively. Um, a couple of examples of it include Intel and Intergraph. So this is from the 1990s. Um, it was a pretty big deal in the late 1990s. And basically the idea here is that... Um, um, in this case, and now we're seeing it come back up like we talked about in class, this idea of intellectual property rights creating temporary monopolies for these firms. Um, this case fell out of the realm of the Sherman Act, but the, basically the idea here was that Intergraph argued that Intel had to share its intellectual property so that Intergraph could be competitive, and Intel refused. Um, the FTC settled the case in 1999, um, Intergraph continued to pursue it in the courts, and it was argued that Intel and Intergraph were not strict competitors, and so Intel didn't have to deal. They could refuse to deal in that opt in that situation. Um, another example is, and I think this is kind of a cool, interesting example: the Eastman Kodak and Image. Um, technical services case. And so this is a case where basically Kodak acted as a monopolist and refused to supply inputs for downstream competitors. It's kind of like the Alcoa example, right? Alcoa where they owned every stage of production of aluminum. In this case, Eastman Kodak um, had a lot of vertical integration and refused to sell inputs to image technical services. Uh, so it had to do with aftermarket components and the cost of switching from the kind of film that Eastman Kodak used to another kind of film and the market costs associated with that. And so it kind of raises the question of whether um, a firm that has a little tiny bit of market power uh, might have a lot of extensive market power later on um, in in a downstream market. And, and it gets back to this idea that it's not just about the market that we're talking. It's not right just about one market. It's not just about the final good market. It might be about the inputs or after service or something like that. So 
That is everything in chapter eight that we are going to talk about. Hopefully that gives you a nice sense of the kind of stuff that we can see in monopolization and with predatory pricing and what some of the court cases and examples of them have been through history. Um, let me know what questions you have and I'll see you next time. Thanks.